Welcome to Sleepless Run and Plays Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game. An introduction and a walkthrough. Right now I have laid out a couple of the things in the starting area. I've laid out the box. There's a little bit of a title in the corner. I've created myself a kind of like a components pool over here on the side. Just where I have the stuff I'm expecting to use. And I've already begun setting up the market up top on the board. Up here we have the three merchants. Level 1, level 2, and level 3. They did not need to be shuffled at this point in time. I just laid them down. I put out the salvage deck. I've already shuffled it. And I put out the events deck, which I've also shuffled. Although I will not be using the events deck today, I've just laid it out as a demonstration of how the board should look when you're setting up. Then, once you have that basically set up, you will seek what kind of quarry you and your fellow hunters are going to go after. The core box comes with only one quarry card. The Sawtooth. The Sawtooth is our big objective. However, in order to get there, we'll have to traverse through many encounters in the wilds before we're able to become strong enough to take on the Sawtooth. So in order to do that, we have to set up our encounter deck. To set up your encounter deck, you take the level 3 encounter cards. There are four of them. Shuffle them. Place them face down underneath the events deck. You'll take the level 2 encounter cards, and you'll also shuffle them. Again, Placing them on top of the level 3s, below the encounter deck. Shuffle the level 1 encounter cards, and of course, the same thing happens again. For this demonstration, and this walkthrough, I'm going to be playing two different hunters. Because as much as I tried to find, I couldn't find good and concise victory conditions for a solo play in the main rulebook. The, the box says 1-4 to four players. And I completely can see playing this on your own. There's just no real goals or victory conditions. I think you completely you can make up your own, like how much glory you amass, or maybe X every so many glory is worth a half sun, then a full sun, then a blazing sun. Uh, amass the most glory, amass the most suns, kill the most enemies. I mean, th there's a variety of things you could do. But the simplest way, we're going to do the competitive multiplayer walkthrough. The cooperative is a lot like the competitive, only you remove a few elements. Glory works differently, and so do the, the fledgling and the leader tokens. So for my two huntsmen I've picked up, I decided to play the Banuke Survivor and the Nora Marksman. Conveniently, both the ones out of the small insert for the box. To create your hunter... You will simply take the hunter's cards, and you'll find all the starting cards. They'll have the their their your equipment cards and your uh, skill level card. Then you'll want to make a deck of all the zero cards. They will have zero in the corner underneath the symbol for your clan or your tribe. I've already removed all the ones that have a higher value of one, two, or three. I've taken them out of the deck to make it easier for myself. So here we have our Nora. I'm not going to have both these on the field because it's going to take up too much space to be too hard to see. So I'm going to end up having one of these set up in the uh, supply zone on the side. It may not be completely visible during the whole video, but don't worry. It will be... I'll be using it correctly. I'll be pulling up the cards that are important to see as I'm playing. We really won't need the level up card because I'm not going to be using it for in this game. But I will show you how it works. When you first load out, you'll find these little small tokens in your box. There are four of them, one per hunter. They go on the start mark of your thing. After each encounter in the campfire phase, you'll end up leveling up your hunter. If you succeed. If you failed, you don't level up your hunter. But I've already pulled I just pulled the cards out for completeness' sake. I'm gonna leave those turns aside. I'm not gonna actually deal with them because we're only gonna play one encounter today. You'll want to shuffle the deck of cards for your hunter because there's multiple things in here and just set it off to the side they have the same backs between the two hunters so you want to make sure you don't mix up the decks doing the same thing with the banuke survivor again i've already separated out my higher level cards from my lower level cards i'm going to keep the higher level cards off to the side so i won't need them for this mat for this encounter so my level one It's very important that the equipment is placed as thus when you're building your hunter because 
you can have other equipment that can actually be up here and then you can have enhancements that come off the equipment these are just represented by these symbols right here the weaves and the coils so you'll want to leave space for them as well you also can get other ability cards that can fill in spaces as well but you can get additional weapons that go up here if you'll notice right there a card just sharpshooter bow can be equipped as a fourth weapon slot So what I've decided to do for this one is I've decided to award the leader token to the Banuk and the fledgling token to the Nora. I randomly decided this earlier, so that's how they're going to be set up. Then we move on to the determining the encounter step. The leader, being the Banuk, draws the top three cards of the encounter deck. Secretly, they will look through and decide on which one they want to play. I'll show the cards right here. I'm going to go with this one because it has an additional thing on the field. And I want to show those off. I'm going to pick that card. It goes right here. And the other cards are simply discarded to the side. They're out. They're done. No, 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 I need them. Now I look for the boards that I'll need to lay out for the map. Now, because of the table space I have that's limited, I'm going to set the map up in this configuration right here. Just so it'll be easier to lay out the boards on the table. I need boards 2A, 3, 4, 1, 2. Make sure it's on the 1 and 2 side. And then you want to make the dot, make sure the dot, which is right here, align to the dot right there. I'm going to cover up my Hunter's Call card because I don't need that at the moment. I'm hoping I have enough space to show all this in the, in the area. Okay, now I need 4A, 4A, uh, 1 and 2 side, 4A's dot. Then let's see, I need 6A. 6A, that's the one and two side. 6A is one and two. Goes in here like thus. I'm going to just scooch everything up a little bit. So hopefully it's on the camera. Now I need to set the tokens on the, on the map. We find the square areas, and in the square areas, we're gonna be putting out uh, machine racks. We have a square area right there. Yeah, because we have triangles, squares, triangles. Okay, so we have two machine wrecks on the field. Those are excellent because a hunter can spend an action to draw three salvage cards. Very valuable. They're definitely worth going after. Now we find our monster positions. On all of the A's, we'll be placing out watchers. We have an A right here. That's one watcher. We have an A up here. Another watcher. And that is all of our A's. Okay, we need our B's, which are our striders. We have a B right here. And that is the only B I see. Looks like we only have three monsters. Or three, sorry, three machines. I should call them machines. We have three machines, which is perfectly fine. Because we only need to get two encounter points to win. Each of these machines, because they're smaller and weaker machines, is worth a single encounter point. The encounter points are the very bottom symbol. I'll blow this up in a larger card picture. But for now, just know that the bottom symbol, the, the cross spears, those are your encounter points. Okay, I'll bring out the AI cards. These each only have a single AI card. Now, if we look on the thing, we'll notice the 2A is highlighted in a big white circle. That means that's your starting board. Your starting board allows your hunter to start on any edge square in which there is not a monster. Now, the way I'm looking at this map, I'm seeing one, two, three, four, five, six edge squares to start in. That's pretty solid. So let's see, our Banuk is gonna be aggressive and wanna get right up on this watcher and just try to take it out as fast as possible. The Nora though, being the fledgling, is gonna go after the supplies because the fledgling wants to go to the merchant and get more stuff. So my, my Nora is gonna start there and that is the setup. Oh, before we actually get further into the game, let's quickly discuss the dice. The dice are quite interesting. The orange die, your most basic attack die from what I can tell, or most basic a uh, die, because you use your dice for attack and defense. Arrows are successes. Arrows going into a hexagon with like explodey lines or whatever are criticals. And then there's the unfortunate blank. So if you look at the orange die, you'll notice there are three one sides, a two side, and a critical side. It's a pretty good die. The blue die is your precision die. The blue die 
has one, two, two ones, three twos, and a three. No criticals though. So it's precise, but it will never explode into something cool. That's where the black die comes in. It's half blanks, half crits. This is your random chance die. It's a 50-50 coin flip die that half the time is amazing and half the time is a spoil your mood die side. So that's all set up for the actual encounter. It's a small encounter. It shouldn't take very long to play through. So let's start off. So the leader always goes first. So the Banuk is going to draw five cards from their shuffled action deck. If I had, a, if I already had a hand of cards, if I wanted to, I could discard any number of cards I wish to and then refill my hand. If somehow I end up with more than five cards in my hand at the start of my turn, I do not have to, absolutely do not have to discard down. I can keep my larger hand size, six, eight, ten, whatever size it is. I'm able to keep that and I can continue to play with that many cards. That can be a downside though, because this deck is not just your actions you're playing. This deck is your hunter's stamina. It's your health. When your deck is emptied, you faint. That's not a good thing. Right now, since we have two hunters, if we faint twice, we lose the encounter. So we don't want to do that at all. What I have drawn for cards is I have drawn three arrows and two reactions. You play them when a trigger occurs. When this hunter has six or less cards in their action deck, scrap this card when they are attacked to ignore all damage and effects of the attack. In other words, I have this situation. I can play this when that situation comes up. This one is a different one. This one is just literally play any time. You search this hunter's action deck for any card, add the card to your hand, then shuffle the action deck. I'm actually going to be using the ready to strike card on my first turn though because I know how I want to play this hunter. So I'm going to discard this card to the side. I'm going to go into my action deck and I'm looking for a very specific card. It's called Sacrifice. This ability can only be used when performing a melee attack. So it's got the little attack symbol on it. Discard up to two additional cards from your hand to add an additional orange die for each discarded card. That's awesome. And I'll show you why as soon as my hunter decides to make an attack. So my Banuka is already at point blank range and I've only, oh, I should cover this. Each hunter gets to take two actions on their turn and they have a total of six actions they can take that aren't something built into the game like this right here. This is a separate kind of action. It's not in the hunter's action list. Your actions are sprint, which is move two spaces. So if I was the Nora and I wanted to sprint, I could go one, two. However, if I do so, I alert the adjacent enemies adjacent to any of the squares I'm in during that turn. So if I'm starting here, I sprint up. Oh, I've alerted both watchers. Both watchers are now going to be uh, angry and unhappy with me. Instead of sprinting, I can sneak one space. Doesn't alert anything. Just moves you one square. Now, when it's one square, this is forward or diagonally. All squares are one square from wherever you're at. It's very simple. All adjacent squares are one square. There's no strange math for going corner or uh, uh, caddy corner. It's just one square. The other thing you can do is you can craft. This is the only action you're allowed to take twice. Every other action you can only take once per turn. So you can craft up to twice. And each time you craft, you can shuffle the bottom three cards from your action discard pile into your draw deck. You spend both actions, you can return all six cards. So that's why it's kind of nice to be able to do that. When it comes to the crafting, I couldn't find anywhere that you can actually do the craft action if you have less than three cards in your discard pile. I don't know. If you can or not, that's not really clear. It just says shuffle the bottom three cards. <sighs> what if I only have two cards? Can I do that? It doesn't say shuffle up to the bottom three cards. It just says shuffle the bottom three cards. I think this is kind of a fackable instance right here. I'd like to know whether or not I can do less or I have to do three. It's a good question. Okay, let's move on to the next action. So that was the first three actions. That was sprint, sneak, craft. The next action is distract. Distract is choose any target square and a non-alert enemy, they have to be non-alert, within two squares of your hunter. So this is any target square. So I can I can look at my Banuke and I can look at this square up here. This is a this is a square that is a target square. It's any square. Then I can find a non-alert enemy right here within two squares of my hunter, easily there. And I can move the enemy 
one square towards its target square. I can move my I can move the watcher up to there. Then we have our final two actions are our different attack actions. We first have a ranged attack action, which you can fight which you can use by using your ranged weapon. It will tell you on the bottom corner of the card the range that it can affect, the dice, and what happens when you roll a critical. It also shows you the kind of ammo you need, and it has the ability to have one coil attached. Coils will add special effects. So, two orange dice at range two. To play a ranged attack, you must spend a melee card, or a ammo card, sorry, must spend an ammo card. One of these cards. The symbol in the corner must match up to the weapon symbol, and you can spend that card. You have to spend it when you use a ranged weapon. The other form of attack is the melee attack using your melee weapon. Melee weapons have a range of zero, but range of zero is adjacent to you or there. Because with melee attacks, you get to do something special. When you melee attack, you move into the square with the enemy. So where I'm at, as long as I'm adjacent to the enemy's square, I can declare a melee attack and I will enter that square. They have the same thing. They have the dice they give and their critical effect. You'll, be, you'll notice, interestingly, the Banuk Spear has a blue die. When we look at the blue die, there's no critical symbol. But it has a critical effect that does two damage and freezes the target. Interesting. Interesting. It doesn't come with orange die or black die. Hmm. Okay. So let's go back to the Banuk's actions. I've already played an interrupt card in order to get another card. The first action I'm going to take with my Banuk Hunter is to just do a melee attack. I'm not going to move, I'm not going to do anything, I'm just going to do a melee attack. So I move into the area with the Watcher, and I select my Banuk Spear to make the attack roll with. The Banuk Spear gives me one blue die. Now is where this comes in. I'm going to play Sacrifice. This ability can only be used when performing a melee attack. Discard up to two additional cards from your hand and add that number of orange die. So I'm going to discard an arrow and that experience the hardships card because I got that too early. I'm going to toss those over there. I'm going to add two orange dice to my roll. Okay. I now roll these dice to see what I get for results. I have five arrows. That's five damage. Since the Watcher is not alerted yet, I never alerted it. I didn't, it didn't get alerted before I attacked it. Then I ignore the armor. I'll blow up a picture of the Watcher card right here. It has one armor. That's the shield symbol. When I'm attacking a non-alert enemy, I ignore that. However, in the case of the Watcher, since I rolled five, it wouldn't have mattered anyways. As it is, it has four health. That's the top symbol, the little computer chip symbol. And it just dies. I crushed it with one solid strike with my uh, Banuk Spear. So the next symbol down, the gear symbol, tells me how many salvage cards I get. I get a whopping singular salvage card for my Banuk, Banuk Survivor. It is Metal Shards, the most common card in the deck. The next symbol down, the Sun symbol, tells me how many glory I get. My Banuk Survivor gets one glory for taking out that Watcher. The last thing on there is the Downward Spears we talked about. Those are in counterpoints. We've now gained one in total in counterpoint for killing the uh, killing the enemy. We need two encounter points to end the count encounter successfully. So we've killed one. Okay, so that's my Banuk. That's only my Banuk's first action, though. I have another action. I'm going to... No, I'm going to craft. I am going to craft. There's nothing really else my Banuk needs to do right now. So my Banuk will craft. I really like Sacrifice. It's a good card. The arrow... And the one that lets me go and... Oh, and then ready to strike because that lets me go and find sacrifice again. I'm going to take those cards and I'm going to shuffle them back into my action deck. Action decks are not too big right now. There are only 16 cards for the Banuk and the Nora. I don't know what the other ones... I think the other ones might be different sized. But there are only 16 cards of those. My Banuk has two cards left in their hand at the end of, the, end of their activation. They're done. Now it's time for my Nora. My Nora draws five cards. You always draw at the beginning of your turn, and you also get a discard then, because that tells you whether you can you can adjust your hand to how the people play. If you all of a sudden realize that you desperately need a ranged arrow, you can now discard cards in the hopes of getting an arrow. So my Nora drew 
two arrows, a reaction or a interrupt card, and two action cards. Wow, that's just a very basic one. Inventive, add an additional orange die to this attack. Very simple. Okay, so let's go with my Nora. My Nora's first action is going to be very simple. I'm going to take this, I'm going to get rid of it, and I'm going to draw three cards off the top of the salvage deck for my Nora fledgling. We got Blaze, Metal Shards, and an Ancient Statue. There are, I think, ten of these special cards in the deck. The Ancient Statue is really kind of cool. Discard this card during the Merchant Strip to reveal the top three cards from the Merchant Deck and purchase one of them at the cost of a single Metal Shard. Once this has been res resolved, even if a card is not purchased, shuffle the other cards back into the deck. Then my Fledgling is going to attack with her bow. She has a Hunter Bow. That is two orange dice. We have to use a Hunter Arrow because we have to use ammo. That's another orange die. And I'm going to play Inventive, just kind of to show it off, which adds a fourth orange die. So my Nora is going to go all out on this shot of this Watcher. It wants to make sure I get it killed. Okay. So we're going to play that. We got, the, we got that set of cards. Nora's going to roll. Woo! Good thing we got that crit. If we hadn't got that crit, that Watcher would have survived this initial shot. So instead, the crit produces two, and that produces two. These dice produced unhappiness, so they're going to go away. We got four damage, has four health, one point of armor, but we're ignoring the armor right now because it's still not alerted. And so the Watcher dies. The Watcher dies, we go through the whole steps. Once again, the Nora gets a salvage card. Ooh, Machine Core, double shards, twice the value. Then we're going to gain a glory for the Nora. And then we have one additional encounter point. These two cards are discarded. They're done. I return my Hunter Bow to my Nora. You don't have to pull the weapons out when you're actually playing. I'm just doing it for demonstration purposes. So then we go on to the, enemy, the enemy's phase. The Strider has not been alerted because we haven't attacked it. There hasn't been an enemy to alert it or anything like that yet. So, so far, so good. The Strider is just going to do its normal basic thing. As a non-alert enemy, all the Strider does is move one space along the little arrow path that it has to follow out there. If for some reason it follows the arrow path off the map, it's wandered away and we failed to kill it. That's, that's on us. We should have been doing better. So as it is, the Strider is just wandering about. So... As we're seeing, in a two-player game, it really looks kind of like it's pretty easy if you're, like, doing the right stuff. So now we go to the end, the uh, maintenance phase. The last phase is the maintenance phase. In the maintenance phase, we see if we have any faints, if, if anybody's fainted, and we, count, and we count the number of faints that have happened. If we fainted twice with two players, that's it. We failed the hunt. It's over. Too bad. So sad. We screwed up. We, we'd end the encounter. We go to the campfire phase. And we'd skip two-thirds of the campfire phase because we just stunk. And we're just awful. We just, we don't deserve stuff. But we have two encounter points, which is enough for us to declare a success. But if we declare the success, we don't get a bonus. You'll see in the corner of the card, there's a bonus. Two salvage cards per player if we wipe out all the machines. Well, that seems worthwhile. There's only a strider left. Surely two hunters can take out a strider. So we're going to choose to not end the encounter. We're not going to stop. Absolutely not. So we proceed back to the hunter phase. It's the Banuk's turn. The Banuk has two cards in hand. And I'm not going to discard them because if they're ammo, I might use my bow. So I'm just going to draw three new cards. I want my Banuk to get over here. Because I saw the Nora steal the machine, uh, the machine bits. And that was really cool. So my Banuk wants to get more salvage also. Being greedy, but it's okay. So I'm going to choose my first action, the Banuk, to sprint. I'm sprinting like that because I don't alert any enemies. I could choose to sprint other ways or water if I really felt like alerting the Strider. In fact, I'm not worried about alerting the Strider. If the Strider gets alerted, oh no, it'll have a point of armor. 
and it will attack us. And we kind of want to see what's going to happen when the enemy attacks us, don't we? Instead, I'm going to have the Banuk do that. Uh-oh. It's alert. That's fine. Because, quite literally, if you don't see the thing attack you, it's not a good demonstration. So my Banuk will just simply move into here, using my Banuk spear to attack. And I'm literally just going to roll the blue die. I'm not going to do anything else. I could do more, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to demonstrate this attack. It's alerted, so it only takes one damage. This is fine. It's got six health. It's not dead yet. So my Banuk's playing kind of weird. But I want to show off a few more mechanics of the game before I actually complete the scenario. Because I've played this several times as a test by myself. And with two hunters versus three machines, it's not a hard scenario. You'll, you don't, you're never going to have any difficulty getting past this one. The intro one is pretty simple. So now it's my Nora Survivor's turn. My Nora Survivor has three cards left. So I'm going to draw two because I really want to have that arrow. I really want that sliding shot also. So I drew two cards and I got hunt, another Hunter's Arrow and a Precision Strike. My Nora is going to sprint first. I need to get close enough to shoot the, uh, shoot the Strider. So my next action is going to be a range attack using the Hunter's Bow. A Hunter's Arrow. And we're going to target a component because we're the Nora. The Nora's special ability on their card is accurate. When targeting components with a range attack, you may reroll any number of dice. This is very important. Because normally, the Nora's special ability, if I'm like actually fighting watchers or whatever, the Nora's special ability is utterly useless. Watchers have no components. So until you get to the Striders, the Nora's not as effective in combat. Whereas the Banuk's ability lets them kind of like spend their life to gain more glory. It's kind of a cool ability. I didn't use it. So here's the Nora. We've got our three orange dice. And the attack is targeting component, which we're going to target the blaze canister. We're going to ignore its armor. Because usually the armor value is applied to the components also if the enemy's been alerted. If they're not alerted, again, the armor value does not apply to the roll. So we've got three dice. And we're ignoring the armor because of precision strike. Two. Good thing we ignored the armor because the destruction value on the blaze canister is also two. So we destroy the component. Hooray! When you destroy the component, it does two damage to the enemy. That's the number right there. And it lights the enemy on fire. Then I'm going to play my Nora card, Critical Hit. Play after the hunter destroys a component, draw a card from the salvage deck. My Nora is not getting a lot of glory, but my Nora is making out like a bandit when it comes to equip when it comes to goodies. This is kind of how the Nora is going to play a little bit. So I used up three cards for my Nora. Discard those. Turn the hunter's bow. And that's the round for the hunters. Now it's time for the enemies to go. The Strider has been activated. So we look at. So when the it had an ability called Herd Instincts. I didn't actually do this. When this enemy becomes alert, it moves one space towards the closest enemy. There was no enemy on the field. When the cards say... Okay, this is the one thing I thought is very confusing in the rules. And I wish they'd used a different wording. When, an, when a machine card says enemy, it means another machine. You are not the enemy. You are the hunters. The machines are always the enemy. So when it moves closer to an enemy, it's moving closer to another machine. There are no, no other machines on the field at the time, so it wouldn't do anything. The Striders are actually really good for cascading alertness amongst other machines, and so are the Watchers. They're both really good at alerting other machines. However, in this scenario, they start off so far apart that it's actually really easy to take them to pieces. You can just sort of keep killing them individually, and they're not going to alert anything. So, then we look at the Striders card. Is another enemy, again another machine. Read the word enemy as machine. It'll be much easier. Is another enemy within two squares. There are no other enemies in the battlefield, so we can't do the yes column, so we do the no column. Move one towards the closest enemy. That's optional. It can't do that. There are none. Move toward towards the closest hunter. It doesn't have to. There's a hunter in its square already, which is perfect for it because it now is going to make its melee attack, 
which is a range zero attack that does four damage. When enemies attack, they don't roll dice, you roll dice. You're rolling defensive dice. So the Strider will do four damage unless my Banuke can roll its armor. The Banuke Ice Hunter Light Armor is a black die in defense. I'm immune to freezing, which is fine. On a critical, I block four damage. On a blank side, I block no damage. This armor is a gambling armor. It's half good, half bad. So let's see how it goes. When I've been playing this a lot, I've been rolling a lot of criticals of the black die when I've been playing by my, playing as learning the game myself. So it's been kind of funny. My Banuke has been like this tank monster that takes like no damage. Now watch, since I've said that, I'm going to roll a blank. A blank! Okay, that's really easy to do then. When a hunter is wounded, you discard one card from either your hand or the top of your hunter deck for each point of damage. If you cannot do this, or if your action deck at the start of your turn runs out of cards, you faint. See, like I said, your action deck is your life. If you faint, you lose all your glory. And that's bad. You don't want to lose your glory. Oh, additional point, uh, fainted hunters no longer count as targets for the enemy. So my hunter, my Banuke hunter, has a very full hand of cards. So why would I actually go to my deck right now to get rid of cards? There's really no need to because by loading up my discard pile with cards, I can essentially have the ability, if I need to next turn, to just craft and restore my health. So I'm going to discard out of my hand. I'm going to discard a Hunter Arrow, a Hunter Arrow, and that stupid Experience and Hardships card, which I think would probably be pretty good if I've actually taken a lot of damage. But I haven't, so I'll just toss those aside. That was only three cards, and I will spend one card off my deck because I take four damage. So, I do. Now, after you've been attacked, a hunter must always dodge. A dodge is literally moving one square away from being attacked, where you're being attacked at. You always have to move. This is non-optional. When the first time I played the game, I actually didn't realize that. It's a, a, a fine point in the thing, but it's something you have to do. You have to dodge. Even if my Banu Hunter had rolled a critical on my armor and I take no damage, I still have to dodge. Just like playing the video game, you're always moving around these enemies. If you stand still, you just get crunched. And you don't want to get crunched. So you have to dodge. It's a required rule in the game. But I actually set that up on purpose because I wanted my Banu Hunter to be at the scrap machine. I'm ready to go. Okay, so the enemy's made its attack. The last thing that happens this turn is the fire is resolved. You resolve the effect of fire. Now, the fire effect is simply, it takes damage. So our machine is currently sitting at 4 out of 6 health. It's it's hurting right now. So now we go to the maintenance phase. If we've, again, if we felt like it, we could choose to end the encounter. But the enemy's only got 2 health left. There's still machine stuff out there to grab. We don't want to end right now. We want to keep trudging on. So we're going to keep going. Again, it's the Banuke's turn. The Banuke has 2 cards. And draws three more. The first thing we're going to do with the Banuke is we're going to get our get our cards. We want our salvage. So the Banuke draws three cards. We got a blaze, metal shards, and a machine lens. This counts as a shard and a shard and either a shard or one of the three supplies: blaze, chill water, or I think they're the the sparkers or whatever. So our Banuke has good money right now. Then the Banuke is going to play my favorite card again. We're going to play Ready to Strike. We're going to we're running a bit of a gamble. We're going to go try and find another copy of Sacrifice in here. And take that card into hand. The Banuke is going to try to steal the glory from the Nora. So we're going to play. We're going to declare a melee attack with our Banuke Spear again. We're going to play Sacrifice. And we're going to discard Driven and one of our mini arrows. So that's two more cards we discard. We add our two orange dice from that and the one blue die from the Banuke Spear. Roll the dice. We do four. We subtract one damage because of armor and that still does three damage. Three damage to the uh, Strider means it's at seven. The Strider dies and the Banuke once again is victorious over a machine. So we go down the machines list. The Banuke gets one scrap card, or salvage card, 
it gets one glory. It adds one to our total for encounter points. Then we can put the strider away because it's dead and we no longer need to deal with it. Now, we've completed the encounter successfully and killed all the machines. Each hunter now gets two salvage cards. Sparker. And another sparker for the Banuke. A metal shard. And a sparker for the Nora. They both have a lot of money right now. This is going to be a really good merchant phase for them. Now that we've done completing the encounter and we've destroyed all the enemy machines, we now move on to the campfire phase. The campfire phase is done in three parts. If you lose the encounter, you skip parts one and two and go straight to the merchant phase. If you successfully complete the encounter, you will go to the victory step first, and you will be awarding sun to the people and moving the fledgling and the leader tokens around. In our encounter, our Nora Marksman achieved one glory for killing the Watcher and didn't use any special cards. The Banuke Survivor got two glory for killing both a Watcher and a Strider. So in two players, the player with the most glory points is awarded a full sun token and takes the leadership token. The other player takes the fledgling token. So in two player game, you only award full suns. You don't award anything else. So the Banuk is once again the leader, the Nora will be once again the fledgling, and the Banuk will be awarded a full sun. Once you've distributed the, distributed the leader and the fledgling token, and everybody has received their suns, all glory for that encounter is discarded. Then, after you have given out the glory and the leadership tokens, you go to the level up stage. This is where we're going to be using those interesting cards that we saw earlier. So my Banuke Survivor has successfully completed a level one mission. I can now choose to advance. You can only advance provided that the encounter you completed is a level higher than you're currently at. So level zero, I completed a level one encounter. I can advance into level one. In doing so, I pick one of the two paths of the skill tree and move my token towards it. The two paths are add intuition or add insulate. So we go into those cards we took for the Banuke earlier that we that had the one, twos, and threes on it. So we find the cards for the two abilities we're looking at. And we can now look at these cards. There are two intuition cards and a single insulated card. The insulated card is just an ability we'll add to our hunter. The ability is, this hunter may scrap cards from the discard pile when suffering damage instead of discarding from their hand or action deck. When you scrap cards, those cards are lost for the duration of the encounter. You cannot repair them, you can't craft them back into your deck, essentially. They're gone until the end of the encounter. I'm not a big fan of insulated. Otherwise, we have intuition. Discard this card to reroll any number of dice when performing an attack or making an evade roll. I like that a lot more. We're looking at black armor, so if I roll a blank, I can re-roll it. And we're also looking at trying to get criticals on my Banuke Spear with my Sacrifice card. So again, Intuition seems like the big one for me. I'd much prefer to play Intuition off the Banuke. So that'd be my choice. I'd add the two Intuition. Now, those cards will go into my deck. My maximum deck size goes from 16 up to 18. And... That means I can add these two cards in. Any cards I buy in the future merchant phase will also go into the deck, and this means that before my next encounter begins, I'll have to make sure my deck is only 18 cards in size. I can discard other cards of the deck, any ones I want to. I can drop out those cards I don't like, or whatever, and I can tailor the deck as I want it to play. I repeat the exact same actions for my Nora Survivor. So my Nora Survivor either gains a card jump o, or the, tra or the Scavenger trait. The Karja Hunter bow is a blue die bow with a critical four. It's exactly like a Banuk spear, but that means I, I don't think there's a lot of cards in the Nora deck right now that are really gonna be good at giving me that extra critical chance. I don't, I'm not a big fan of this bow and it has to replace my Hunter's bow. It's in the same slot, it's the same, uh, Side weapon. It doesn't become a new weapon up here. It goes over here on the Nora. Okay, so I'm not a big fan of that choice, but I like this choice. Scavenger. Whenever another hunter kills an enemy, 
you may draw a card from the salvage deck, take set Gavenger, and go around pissing off the machines by blowing off their components, taking your extra glory and your extra salvage cards, letting someone else kill them, or kill them yourself in the future, and if they kill them, instead, you still get money. I think that's a sneakier way of playing the Nora, because I know there are ways of getting glory off of knocking off components as well, so the, sa the scavenge is my personal favorite card. Why not get a benefit from your friend does something for you? Even if they don't mean to be doing something for you. So, that's the way I'd go with the Nora. Next, we move on to the merchant phase. So we're going to grab the merchant deck, and we shuffle it. You shuffle it before you actually do the laying out. When you do the merchant deck, you are looking to draw out on the tabletop one weapon, one armor, two ammo, two modification cards. Those are the coils and the weaves, and one miscellaneous card. Until you have that out, you'll be discarding cards off to the side. So, here we go. So we've now got the we we've now got the upgrades, the armor, the weapon, and the ammo done. We're just looking for the first miscellaneous card. And we just keep going through the deck until we find one. And there we go. Shard Gambler's Box. The leader is always the first one to buy. So we got a lot of options right here. I like the damage coil a lot. So I'm going to spend one metal shard to buy the damage coil. I would just add that to the Banuke Spear. Now if you notice on the Banuke Spear, the Banuke Spear has two upgrade slots, which is really cool. Actually, all the spears might have two upgrade slots. Notice the normal one does too. So when that's bought, it's filled in. The slot is filled in. There we go. As the fledgling, the first thing the Nora gets to buy, they don't pay the cost on. He gets some free fire arrows. Or maybe I'll just take a resist melee weave. It's free. It makes my Nora more durable against melee. So I think I'm going to take a free resist melee weave. Because why not save two shards? So now we're going to try to find another armor. There we go. Another damage coil. So I'm just going to stop buying stuff right here. The way the buy is going to go is every player keeps buying as much as they want to buy until they say, I'm done buying. Or you run out of one kind of card in the deck. One kind, you know, all the weapons are gone, all the armor's gone, all the other stuff's gone. If any of those things are ever gone and you need a refill and you can't find it, then the merchant phase is over. So it's either everybody stops buying, saying, I'm, I'm done, or you run out of a certain item and you can't refill it. With the merchant phase over, everybody having bought what they want to or not, whoopsies, careful. You clear the battlefield area and you return to the encounter step. And in this case, with the leader and the fledgling both active, the leader would draw three cards from here and pick one to go out. And the fledgling is going to draw three cards from the event deck and choose one to play. If you're playing cooperatively, you do not draw cards from the event deck. I'd also assume if you're playing solo, you probably wouldn't either, but there's no clarification on that one. So I can't tell you if that's true or not. I need to actually go through the entire list of encounters until I have all four slots filled right here. So you'd fill, once you've completely completed four encounters, you go onto the Hunter's Call. That's your final mission where you have to take down the big, big Sawtooth, which that sounds like a lot of fun. I need to actually do that on my own at some point in time. I've just done this first mission a few times and I really enjoy playing this first encounter. It's, it's interesting. I like it a lot. I really like this game. Only thing I'm kind of wishing for is I wish they'd given us a game board area for these cards. Like, just like in a foldable, like, you know, two sheet, like, game board that would have, like, little zones drawn on there for us. It's just me being picky, but it kind of made me feel like that's a bit more organized. That's really, really the only downside I'm seeing to this whole game. It's a lot of fun. It's very simple, very easy on the rules. Once you go through it two or three times, maybe even only one time you'll have the basic rules down pat. 
if you don't have to explain a lot of stuff, it actually plays pretty quickly. I enjoy this. I can't wait until we get some more of the machines like the Bellowbacks and the Behemoths all the way up to the Thunderjaw. Oh, I want to fight the Thunderjaw. But yeah, I mean, once you get that big old pile of uh, games, you know, there's a pile of games right there, then, uh, yeah, this is going to be fantastic. I, I'll, I'll enjoy playing this a lot. This would be a game I'd want to take into a game store with, my, with me and just go, so who wants to play this stack of games? It's one game. There's a lot of options, though. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to the full thing. The one base box, I can, I'm can. i going to get some good fun out of this thing by itself. But come July, oh, it's going to be so much better. I mean, it's already good. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's already a lot of fun. But I'm looking forward to having all of the options that are going to come in July. I think we're going to get a lot more cards to add to things. I'm, I'm expecting we're going to get a lot more miniatures and a lot more different things to do. Because I know there's also, like, there's enemy like human enemies out there and stuff like that i'm gonna be interested to see how they play so in this game it's a real thumbs up for me i'm really enjoying it a lot um that was like my fourth or fifth play and uh yeah i'm very happy with it yeah that's pretty much it so if you enjoyed this video please hit like and subscribe and uh join me in the hunting grounds for the next one i plan on doing a couple more uh review videos for other board games mainly things i've kickstarted so this is sleepless running saying Sayonara.